<laughs> All right, what's going on, everybody? Brooklyn Fight Shoot the Five in the building, the one and only Xavier Porter. I got my guys on the line right now. I got Mr. The Iceman, John Scully, straight out of Hartford, it's Connecticut. It. And I got my other guy, Tommy the Razor Ray Nolan, straight out of Long Island, New York. Now these two guys have been going at it on Facebook. Like they've been <laughs> they they've been going at it like cats and dogs, man. Like like <laughs> Ali and Frazier. And, and I, I said to myself, these these guys are so funny. They're keeping everybody in positive, good spirits. I said, you know what, these guys need their own show. So I wanted to mod I wanted to be the first to moderate it before somebody come with a huge deal for y'all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so first off, how y'all yeah. guys doing today, man? How y'all doing out there? Everything's good. good over here. Okay. Yeah, man. Good day. Just chilling, watching TV. <laughs> Being lazy. <Okay>. Productive so, <laughs> day. Uh, it's, it's, it's coming. They, they be in culture right now. They throwing the jabs right now. They testing the distance. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just circling each other a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know. So what you that? So wait, let me conduct this interview just a little bit. So, so Ice Man, what'd you do today? Let me hear about your day. Let me see. Uh, watch TV. <laughs> and, uh, let's see. That's it, pretty much. Did you, watch anything, did, you, did you watch anything new? Was it like a new show? Was it like, were you watching uh, Miami ah, Vice? Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. Blue Bloods. Never seen it. It's a good show. I think uh, it might be Algeria. I think Chris Algeria was on an episode of that. Either yeah. Chris or Paul Malinaji, one or the other one. One or the other was on an episode of that. Yeah, yeah. Every once in a while, you see a guy you know. Uh, yeah. They'll get a guy from New York on the show. Yeah, sure. So that's Not it. You. Just watch, watch TV today, huh? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my day, man. It's uh, hey. I'll tell you what. This uh, Corona got me so messed up. I uh, <laughs> I thought it was Wednesday, right? I'm telling my wife, I'm going, you know, it's Wednesday. She's like, no, no, it's Sunday. I'm telling what? I, I said, I'm telling you, it's Wednesday. You were <laughs> off by three days. I, I lost complete track of the, because wow. every day, just just sitting in the house, watch, doing the same thing every day. <laughs> I lost track of time. Lost track of the days. Wow, one day, one day is all right if it's a Monday, or uh, but but three days, my God. <laughs> how have you got? How have you guys been holding it up? Might be. With, how have both of y'all been holding up dealing with the with the um, you know, the COVID coronavirus and everything? How you two been, you know, handling things? Well, I mean, I'm you know, I'm over it already, but so is everybody else, right? I mean, we're all we're all kind of dealing with the same thing together, so. Luckily, you know, I still got my job at the hotel. Um, but as far as my personal training gigs, and that's out the window right now because of the mandate of all the gyms being closed in New York. So um, I can't do no personal training. Um, but aside from that, honestly, I just go to work and I, I pretty much stay home. That's it. Because uh, there, where am I going to go? You know, people are complaining and protesting, but where are you going to go? You can't go to a restaurant and eat. You can't go to a bar and drink. You can't go to a movie theater. You can't go to a sporting event. So, I mean, I'm not missing out on anything, per se. I'm definitely uh, fiending to, to, to go on a vacation and have some fun and get out of the house, but it is what it is right now. And for, and John? I mean, for me, it was I was in training camp with Better Be of in, uh, in Canada when this happened. And, you know, there, we, we, had, we were in full training camp. We had visited the site of the fight for press conferences. Everything was set. And then when it happened, uh, you know, it was touch and go. They were like, well, we're not sure what's going to happen. And then, right, they gave me a couple of days. They said, all right, you got to get out of the country or else you're going to be stuck here. Wow. So I had to leave. I had to leave right away. And uh, they were going, they were looking into the possibility of doing the fight in Las Vegas with no audience, just, uh, just, a, just a, an arena. And, uh, but that who, fell through. Who was he scheduled to fight? The, the better. Uh, better be if it uh, was supposed to fight Fen Long from China. Okay. And uh, so, you know, so they were going to do it in Vegas, but Vegas wouldn't let it happen. So uh, so we went home and I haven't been in the gym. You know, the gym obviously has been closed here. So the only place I've been, I've gone is right down the street from my house to stop a shop when I have to go shopping, but that's it. 
Okay. Wow. Oh, that, I see Tommy fixing to say something. I see it. I see it in his face. <laughs> I was about to say. Like, well, the only place I've been is the bakery. But I don't know if that's, <laughs> I don't know if that would be uh, essential work if they're open or not, bakery. <laughs> <laughs> Now and you two. Anyway. Now you two guys, you know, like I said, you 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 y'all y'all have this uh this chemistry, I should say. Like you two are y'all go y'all like peanut butter and jelly. Like every time I watch y'all and I see y'all on Facebook, y'all compliment each other's styles and you know, personality, <laughs> humor, you throw jabs, you're very sarcastic with each other. How did this develop? It just it just did, I guess, but it's more like it's like I'm Frazier and he's Ali and he would want to play that role anyway because he sleeps for an Ali because he sleeps for an Ali pillow. But it's been, he constantly putting the aggression on him and him holding like a motherfucker. <laughs> I, Ali stopped Frazier though. <laughs> come on, man. Fight, he stopped the fight. Frazier's eyes were all lumped up. I mean, come yeah, on. But, but, but Frazier won the, the one that mattered, the fight of the century. The first one's the one that everyone remembers. <laughs> yeah. No, they remember the thrill in Manila. They're both of them. Both of them. Second yeah. one was terrible. Second one nobody talks about. Yeah, I've only seen yeah. clips of the second one. I've never, I never even watched the full fight actually. Well, watch the second round. Ali had him ready to go, and the referee jumped in and stopped the, the round. He said he thought he heard the bell, and there was still like a minute or forty-five seconds left. Joe would have been out of there in the second round if the referee didn't. Mess well, up. I'm, I'm gonna watch that tonight actually. Yeah, second watching. round. Ali heard him, and, and the that was also in. that was also with the garden. Yeah, I think Bobby Cassidy uh, fought on the other card. No, maybe did did he fight? Did he fight? Uh, maybe, maybe. Yeah, I'm sure. sure I know he fought the same fight. night. It might have been a net. I think he might have fought at NASA Coliseum that night, and they showed it on closed circuit. Um, the the, the Ali fight afterwards. That might have yeah. been it. I'd have to check on box rack, but or otherwise he fought on the undercard. I think he might have fought on the undercard. Did he fight my quarry ever? No, nah, he never fought quarry because he was a light heavyweight. Quarry was a heavyweight. Yeah, no, Mike that, Quarry, Mike. Oh, Mike, Mike was no, no, no. He fought, he fought a lot of guys, but he never fought my quarry. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Yes, yeah. Well, sorry. How did you get the nickname Iceman? And Tommy, how did you get the nickname Razor? I'll answer, I'll answer both of those questions. <laughs> All right. There's no way. There's no way he didn't get that nickname from Top Gun. Okay. There's no way. Okay. Nah, I was Iceman way before that. Uh, so when so when Top Gun came out, you were really you were really thrilled. Yeah, the dude. It's, it's like Wepner and Ali. He should have. I should have sued that dude. Freaking all the now. Nah, you know what happened? Honestly. When, uh, when I was a kid, the big thing in my school was guys would rank on each other's heads. You know, you say, ah, oh, you big rock head, you big egg head. And uh, like we had Kerwin Khan, for example. He was in my grade. He had a nappy head. He had, he had nappy hair, right? So we used to call him nappy head. And Al Graham was hook head. Dave Coleman was had a big ramp head. His forehead was huge, right? So Albert started saying uh, that I had a square head. And uh, so they would all say, oh, you got a square head, like a block of ice. And mm -hmm. they would go to fights, amateur fights. And I actually have the fight on tape, 1985. They were at the fight. And you can hear them in the background yelling, uh, you know, ice block, come on, ice block, you know. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it evolved from there. Gotcha. <laughs> and then Top, then Top Gun came out and you were in all your glory. Yeah, man, you stole the whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. How did you get the name Razor? Um, you know what? My friend Brennan Franklin actually nicknamed me Razor. I was uh, I was getting in, in, in fights in high school. Actually, middle school it was. Um, way before high school, he nicknamed me Razor in like the seventh or eighth grade. Um, I had whipped somebody's ass, and I gave him a little cut. And uh, and he's just <laughs> like, yo, dude, your shop is Razor. And then everybody started calling me Razor. And that's, and that's why I'm Razor. <laughs> Ice afraid of needles. That, 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 Ice afraid of needles. Just, just real quick. Ice don't have no end. <laughs> yeah, so that nickname just stuck. Oh, when I was about to turn pro, um, I was trying to think a nickname myself, and that same friend, Brent, is just like, oh, dude, what do you mean a nickname? Your nickname's Razor. I'm just like, like a boxing nickname. He's just like, 
dude, everybody who's known you for as the razor for like the last 17 years. You can't change it now. So I stuck with it. Obviously, I don't know what I was thinking about changing it, but uh, yeah, so I stuck with it. Otherwise, I was gonna go with my um my old AOL screen name, Baby Gotti. <laughs> or something 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 interesting. What, that's what? that's actually how, how Tommy and I met through yeah. through AOL when he was Baby Gotti. Uh, you know, there was these chat rooms back then, and they were the best chat rooms on the internet, bar none. Like they were awesome on fight night. And a bunch of fake I, fighters, I, all those fake fighters who who had twenty. There was no box rec back then, X. There's, you couldn't look up a, a fighter's yeah, yeah, yeah. record. So there'd be some guy on there. He's like, "Oh, I'm from uh, Minneapolis. And I got uh, 22 and one with 60 knockouts." But why have we never heard of you? Oh, I got a bad management. <laughs> people would just make shit up, dude. And you knew they were full of shit too. Yeah. And people are threatening you, and you're like, "Yo, dude, you, you, who are you?" It's probably a female behind the screen. But yeah, hey, hey well, let me tell you, I, I, I'll tell you this much. I know this for 100 percent fact. You probably, Tommy, you probably remember me saying this, but. Zab Judah used to go in there. He was, uh, he was, uh, his screen name was Team Yoel. And I was the only one back then who knew who Yoel was. Yeah, and I fun. caught it. I, and I sent him a private message. And then I saw him in Vegas. And it, he was like, yeah, yeah, that was me. But I was in there one night. And this guy, I'll never forget his name, Gigantol, G Y G A N T O L. He's in mm. there. And he's saying that he's Floyd Mayweather. And everybody's like, yeah, right, right, right. And he's like, yeah. Bob Ehrman, I remember he was just trashing Bob Ehrman. And, and he was saying, I'm going to go off on my own. I'm going to do my own thing, blah, blah, blah. So everybody's saying, nah, you're not Floyd Mayweather. So I see him in Las Vegas like a year later. And I ask him, no, and I, I had asked him that night. I said, if you're really Floyd Mayweather, who did you beat in the semifinals of the PAL Nationals in Dallas in 95? Uh-huh. Now, I know he could look up the finals. But you can't look up the semifinals back then. So he couldn't tell me. I said, come on, you're Floyd Mayweather. You don't know who you beat in the semifinals? Yeah. I see him in the gym in Las Vegas. It was him. He's like, oh, man, I, don't, I couldn't even remember. But it was, it was really him. And, but, he uh, can't, but, he, but he can't read or write. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, well, he was – but let me tell you, tell you the best one. Sugar Ray Leonard, uh, there were people who were in there talking about Leonard and Hagler. And how, uh, you know, they didn't have a rematch and Ray held the fight up and blah, 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 blah. So I'm, I'm friendly with Ray. So I told Ray about it. I say, hey, you should check this out, man. They're saying that you didn't want the fight. So he went in there under his screen name, which you might have been able to figure out it was him by, by the name. Uh, and he's arguing. Sugar, with sugar Man? <laughs> no, it was SRL Boxing. And, yeah, uh, you know, and so... Uh, he's in there arguing with people, regulars in the chat room, and they're telling him, no, that's not true, Ray it is, and Ray, and I'm like, man, these freaking people, they're arguing with him, about him, but they don't know it. So, but so I told him, I said, look, you should change your name because uh, people are going to figure out it's you, and then you're going to get 5,000 emails tomorrow. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, he didn't know how to do it, so I helped him change it. He changed it to, I'll never forget, he changed it to... Uh, Power 1976 at AOL. And then he went in there for months, like going back and forth with all these people, and none of them had any idea they were really talking to Sugar Ray Leonard. That's and uh, then he got a Blackberry and he and he changed everything. <laughs> like, yeah, back back you know, in those up. days, back in those days, these are, even if I was just like, all right, Ray, if it's really you, post a picture you holding up a sign that says hello. You couldn't yeah. even do that back then because it was dial up. So that thing would take forever to download. If you wanted a girl to say, you a picture you've been waiting a week for it right <laughs> but i remember those aol chat rooms i remember i talked to mcneely was in there peter mcneely um him i definitely spoke to in there um trying to think of who else no other real big names i can remember there was a guy who said he was mike rossman i don't know if it ever got proven he mm -hmm. swore he was mike rossman but i'll tell you the funny thing about peter uh Peter's a good guy, you know. It but was Hurricane Peter, Peter or something. The name was like Hurricane Peter. Yeah, yeah, here Hurricane Peter. But the yeah. thing is, you know, people think he's a goof. You know, and he is. He is a goof. You know what <laughs> you know, I mean? You know, that's just him. He's just a funny guy. But here's the thing. He loves boxing. He knows boxing very well. Yeah. But people couldn't get past that. And it shows their mentality. 
they're making fun of them and, you know, really being insulting. So I yeah, messaged yeah. this one guy who I knew, and I'm like, listen, man, why are you doing that? Why, why are you doing that to the guy? He's just trying to talk boxing. He goes, oh, that's not really him. I go, I go, yeah, it is. I said, I know the guy. It's him. And he goes, oh, I didn't think it was really him. So I'm like, think about what you're saying. You even – you thought it wasn't him, but you wanted to, you know, slander the name Peter Bailey yeah, yeah. just because you're on the internet. So that was yeah. the only thing I really didn't like about that aspect of it was people would just you couldn't have a big name fighter go in there because people would destroy them and the fighters aren't having it they're not going to stay there for week after week listening to these idiots talk bad about it. Yeah, yeah yeah let me ask y'all this what made y'all get involved in boxing like what led y'all to the sport what led y'all to the ring um well for me the short version is i saw rocky when i was like seven Oh, shit. So I saw Rocky. Um, I wanted to start boxing as early as seven, eight years old. Was and, it a um, was it a was it a Caucasian thing? <laughs> no, nah, no. Nah. You know, and it, and it actually, timing wise, little Ice he set up for that. <laughs> nah, I saw I saw Rocky when I was like seven, and then you know I watched the movie, and then I saw Rocky too, whatever. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, Mike Tyson came on the scene, so okay. I started watching Mike Tyson fight when I was eight years old. That was like the first fighter I was familiar with. And um and it was a real I big deal. Like Mike, 19, Mike, yeah. 1988. Yeah. So um so he got upset by Douglas in ninety. That that was already I was already ten years old at that point. But I had been asking my family for, for two, three years to box already. And this is back back in the late eighties. In the late eighties, there's no internet. Uh huh. Boxing gyms don't exist on every corner. I mean, it's an underground thing. They're mostly, you know, they're spread out across Long Island and Manhattan and Queens in different areas. Um, you can't just find a boxing gym. It's kind of a word of mouth thing back then. So um, I had no idea how I was going to start boxing. And I would say the same thing year after year. I'm just like, you know, I'm going to be a boxer. I'm a professional boxer. And it never went away. My family kind of hoped it was a phase. And then finally, when I turned 17, I moved. I lived, I grew up in Elmont, which is right on the Belmont racetrack, right on the the Queens border right there in Jamaica. Yeah, yeah right by Cambria Heights. So, yeah, so I moved from Elmont to Plainview. When I moved to Plainview and I started going to high school, there was this kid, uh, Brian, who had boxed at Westbury. And he had like three or four amateur fights. And I was, I was like, oh, shit. And he told me, he's like, there's a gym on Post Avenue in Westbury. I didn't have a car. So then me and my other buddy went there. We showed up. And I was just, I remember, I remember the first time I walked in there, dude, just two rings, people sparring, people hitting the bags, like the smell of the gym and the Vaseline, the sweat. And, and I was just like, holy shit, I'm in a real boxing gym. At that point, I was a senior in high school. I was 17, a few months shy of my 18th birthday. So if I could have been boxing at 10 years old, I would have been. So, I didn't get, so, so to me, I got a very late start in the game because by the time I was 17, I was almost 18 years old, I already had afflictions. Like I was already smoking cigarettes, pack of cigarettes a day, yeah. drinking, experimenting with drugs. I had all these bad habits already that, that's, that I kept right on going with in the amateurs. I just I go to the gym and train and just go out and party every night. So when parents ask me, they're just like, yeah, is my son too, too young to box? The answer is always no. You're never too young to learn discipline and, and, and self-confidence and things of that nature. Maybe you could be too young to spar and receive, you know, head trauma. Sure. But you're never too young to box and be disciplined and have, have that kind of focus. So, so again, I mean, I, I basically, the catalyst was seeing Rocky when I was seven and then learn who Mike Tyson was. And then, I remember by the time I was nine, ten years old, I was I knew who all the players were at that point. Like I was watching Terry Norris fights on a regular basis. I remember watching Foreman, um, Foreman Holyfield on pay per view and being excited all week and couldn't wait for Rocky Five, Tommy Morrison. Then I found he was a real fighter, and I'm like, holy shit! He became like <laughs> one of my top favorite fighters. Tommy Morrison's a real fighter, and um, you know there were a handful. And then that was the early '90s. So you had a lot of good heavyweights come up. You had the Fab Five, which was was Ray Mercer. Tommy Morrison, Riddick Bowe, Lennox Lewis, and Michael Mora, all undefeated, all knocking everybody out. It was a very exciting time. So I was like 10 years old at this time, and I was totally – the KO boxing card, Scully's going to remember that. In 1990, they came out with all these boxing sets, 1991. Ring Lords, KO boxing, and I, so I was collecting all the cards and everything. Like, boxing was huge in 1990, 1991, and I wanted to box more than anything, but I had to wait another six years until I finally found out where Jim was and then I had to figure out how to get to that gym every day because I didn't have a car. So however I got there, I got there. I got dropped off. I would take a cab. I'd grow up rides. 
sometimes I would walk home five miles. Like I just wanted to be there, but I wish I started when I was much younger, but I had no control there. Yeah. Yeah. Scully. Well, un unlike at Tommy's house, we had yellow pages <laughs> and we could look up the box of gym. It took like 20 seconds. That, that, that <laughs> was a, a hard thing. jam it right there. Back then. <laughs> it was a big thing back then and you could actually look it up, you know, and a, uh, you didn't have to wait four years. You, go, like, <laughs> you didn't have to wait four years. You could go <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Let me explain something to you. Let me explain something to you. I used to grab the yellow pages and look through the yellow pages for boxing gyms, and I would see one or two of them. But when you're when you when you when you're eight years old, I didn't even know where these towns were. I'd never been to any of these places, so to me, it might as well have been in Alaska. Like there were no boxing gyms near me. Um, many years later, I learned there actually was one in Hempstead. That uh, that's the one that Kevin Kelly started training at when he was an amateur, and that's where Johnny and Eddie Davis came out of and Willie Wise. So they really it was a very good gym gym called timeout boxing gym and that was a big gym in the 80s and uh cooney trained there a lot of guys trained there for long island and um had i known about that i mean i looking back at it now i'm like shit if i could have somehow found out about that gym it was only about 15 minutes from where i currently lived in elmont it was straight down hempstead turnpike but again when you're eight years old you don't know the names of different towns in new york and, and your location and stuff your geography at least i didn't maybe smarter kids do <laughs> maybe here it is that maybe <laughs> that's going but, to be but, like you know yeah you, you, your introduction to the sport and like what led you to the gym um you know my father was a boxing fan he knew everything about boxing he followed you know Willie Pep and Joe Lewis and the whole nine he had all the ring record books uh, where you could look up the records. So my mother and father were divorced and I would stay with him on the weekends. So he was older. He had me at an older age. So, you know, it wasn't like we wrestled and played sports together. You know, he, he would be on the couch doing his own thing, reading the newspaper. So I would read all the boxing books. And the first three books I ever read in my life was um, uh, Willie Pep's book, The Fr Friday's Heroes. I read the autobiography of Sugar Ray, Len Sugar Ray Robinson. And I read the 1952 ring record book and I would just go through the records and I would look at the records and see who beat who. And they had, I remember I had a big picture of Sugar Ray Robinson in the centerfold. So what I would do is I would wrap my hands in toilet paper and I would put white tape over it to make it look like the hand wraps. Mm -hmm. uh, I, my father bought me a pair of gloves that were Everlast. They looked just like the gloves that Ollie and Frazier wore in their first fight. They were the same style. And then I would get that Halloween blood that you have on Halloween to make it look like you're bleeding. I would write out a scorecard, 15 rounds. I would, I would get on the bed and I would fight against an imaginary opponent. And I would do, set the timer. I would do three minute rounds. I would score the rounds. I would put the blood on after certain rounds. You know, I'm getting cut up. You're a weird um, motherfucker. I'm what a weird you, kid. Every weekend I would what? do the fights. I would have, and there was a guy back then named Chuck Hall. If you remember Chuck Hall, he was the best ring announcer to me to, in the way that he announced the decision. Uh -huh. He would say, like he would go 143, 142, and he, he would pronounce the one real strong. So I would uh -huh. do the fights and I would hesitate just like him and, and I would uh, have the winner. Then I would do the post-fight interview in the bathroom, in the mirror. I'd have a hairbrush as the microphone. Would you, would you be interviewing yourself? So I, would or would you be, I would interview my, I would pretend that Howard Cosell was interviewing me. And I wow. would do the interview. So I'm doing this all day, all night, every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And had hundreds of fights. And uh, so finally my father took me to a gym when I, well, no, I backtrack. I started. I wanted to, I got tired of boxing against uh, just myself. So I would start boxing against kids in the neighborhood. I remember I had, I was 12 and 0. I had 12 fights, 12 wins. Uh, my first fight was in May of 1980 against this kid named Tony Vieira. And I remember we were in his basement. I got him up against the washing machine. I was pounding him. And they stopped the fight. I, I beat him on a TKO. And uh, so after that, my father finally found me a gym. Uh, he looked in the yellow pages. It was, you know, it was very easy. And he found one in the yellow pages. 
and uh, I started going to that gym. And, and after my, my first day there, I remember there was a kid, a guy named Bobby Dowden. He was 23 years old and I was 14 and he was my weight. And right away I said, man, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to compete with this guy. I'm going to, I'm going to go here and I'm going to pretend I'm Muhammad Ali with real guys instead of just, uh, just uh, by myself in the bedroom. And uh, so that's how I started March of 1982. I, I went to the, it was called the Windsor Locks Boxing Club. Did you bring the fake blood with you? <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, nah, but it was, you know, you know how it is. I walk in the gym and, and I remember I'm just looking at the locker and the locker, it's got the headgear and it's got the cups and it's got the gloves. And I'm like, this is unbelievable. Like to me, everybody there was a star. And, and the funny look at this is, we're talking, you know, 38 years ago, March of 82. I was 14 years old at the time. I still remember who was there. I mean, yeah. Bobby, Bobby, Bobby Dowden. Mark Sear, Shane Sear, Dave Woodard uh, were, the, were the main guys there at that time. And the, the first guy I ever sparred with, and this is when I knew I might have a little something. The first guy I ever sparred with at that gym was a 17-year-old. I was 14. He was 17. His name was Mark Sear. He's actually my Facebook friend. I've never seen him since, but he's mm -hmm. my Facebook friend. And I sparred with him, and I just was imitating Muhammad Ali. I thought everybody got on their toes and boxed and moved. So he couldn't really hit me that much. So afterwards, he said, he said, wow, you know, how long have you been boxing for? And I'm like, man, like 20 minutes. You know, I just started. He thought I had come from another gym. He thought I had a little, you know, because he couldn't hit me. And my father, I mean, uh, the coach told my father, you know, he's got something. If he sticks with it, he could do something. And uh, so that was it. That, that first day, I was positive that I was going to stick with it. Now, now, let me ask you this. Now, when you remember you going to the gym for the first time, all those names that you just named, the guys that yeah. you just named that were in the gym, how many of those actually were pros? None of them. None of them. They, they, they were amateurs? The only pro in the gym was Robert Foley, who, crazy thing is, 10 years later, I'm in Atlantic City, and he's fighting one of the main events against uh, Iran Barkley. He, he was uh, he was wow. Zora Foley's son, and uh, oh okay, yeah. Now, he was now, Zora did you know son. who? He, did you know? You know uh, did you know who he was when you first walked in the gym? I or no? knew, well, he he wasn't an accomplished fighter at the time, but I knew who Zora Foley was, so I was excited. But you knew this guy was a pro, right? I knew he was a pro, and I was just excited because he was Zora Foley's son. Well, what um, I'm getting at, what I'm getting at, essentially, that's the first professional boxer that you ever saw up close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like, let me ask you this: like, did you there look at him at all, or no? There you go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm actually. Did you look at like when you first when you watched him train or, or anything like that? Did you look at him like, holy shit, like this guy's a pro or no? Well, yeah, you know, to me back then, and I tell you, you know, a long story short, but. I really looked up to pros at the time. You know, I really looked, even as an amateur, even as a top amateur, I looked up to pros. So in a way, when I turned pro, that kind of affected me because pro was different to me, which in, in a lot of ways it wasn't. But to me, I looked at anybody as a pro. I said, wow, this guy must be pretty good. Uh, but what happened was there was a kid named Chris Jarrett. He was a, a middleweight. What he was, was a pro. Name? Chris Christopher Jarrett okay. and uh, he didn't do anything bigger but he was at the gym sparring one day and I was 15 at the time and they put me in with him and uh, and I did extremely well like extremely well and then like two weeks later I see I'm at his fight at the place called the Agora Ballroom and he fought at the Agora Ballroom and I'm like man like to me to be in with a pro at that especially at that age yeah it was like being in with Sugar Ray Robinson. It didn't matter to me. Pro was pro, you know? Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to remember the first pro I ever spawned. I, I'm going blank right now. I, it's one of like three guys. But when I first started training at Westbury, the first pro that I ever saw, what's funny is when I found the way, I, the way that it got reiterated to me about Westbury was I had read an article. I heard there was a gym in Westbury. My friend told me. And then I read an article in Newsday that said Willie Wise was fighting for no Whitaker. And Willie Wise was a fighter from Westbury, Long Island. He trained at the Westbury Boxing Gym. And his son, uh, Dominic, has seizures and, and yada, yada, yada. Wow. And I'm like, wow. I'm like, this guy's fighting Pernell Whitaker. And uh, that fight ended up not happening. And Willie went on to, uh, you know, have a lot of other big fights. 
but the first time I ever walked into the Westbury Boxing Gym, boom, there's Willie Wise hitting the pads. And I'm like, holy shit, I just seen his picture in the paper. Now, you know, to, it's a big deal to you when you're like 17 years old. This is before the internet and everything. Like getting your, getting your picture in the paper is almost like you think somebody's famous. But um, that was the first professional fighter that I ever saw was Willie. And uh, even to this day, all those years later, uh, 20 some odd years later, I still look at Willie as, as, as like a god. Because he's like the first fighter I ever met, first professional boxer I ever met. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I have guys in Hartford that, I mean, it is what it is. Like, my career completely eclipsed theirs. Amateur, yeah, yeah. like, you completely. Still, you, but I still see look at those guys, guys today, like, if I see him today, if I'm, in, if I'm in a supermarket today and I turn the corner and K Kuda Leaks or Papa Figueroa are there, I'm going to be like I met, like I see Ali. Like, as a matter of fact, there was a guy, Papo Figueroa. He was a I big deal in Hartford, you know, back in the day. And I saw him about four years ago. He came in the gym. Nobody knew who he was, you know. Wait, and you I talk about Papo Figueroa from the Bronx? No, no, this guy's from Hartford. He's a Hartford you know I'm talking about Papo Figueroa, though, right? Yeah, yeah, but this is a different. Right? No, no, not Pop. I'm talking about Papo. Papo. Okay. And uh, this guy's older. He was, when I was 17, he was a he already had 30 pro fights. Okay. So uh, uh, to me, he was like an idol, but I've maintained that. I saw him about four years ago and he walked in and, uh, and he said to me, he goes, do you remember me? I said, do I remember you? And I, I went like this. I said, I still got a scar right here from where yeah. you cut my lip open when I was seven years old. Yeah. And he was, you know, he was, he was excited. You know, I said, man, I said, believe me, I'm more excited to see you than you are to see me. Believe me. And uh, yeah. so I never forgot any of those guys, you know. Let me, let me ask you this, John. Yeah. Your, your work and, you know, your work in regards to, you know, for, for fighters who retired. Right. Fighters who are not getting supported and receiving the support that they should. In regards to like you know medical health insurance things like that, how right. how is that going? And express how important that is right now. Well, I'll tell you how I should say. I'll tell you how it's going. Uh, yesterday, I mean the other day, I put up a. Um, actually, Ron Katz has a signed pair of James Tony trunks from back in the nineties. He sure. asked me if I, want, that, yeah. if I wanted them. I said yes, yeah. I, I could do something with that. I put it up. And these three particular guys went at it, bidding back and forth, back and forth. One guy's from Norway. Uh, one of the guys, he won the bid, $730. He's sending me, uh, he just sent me 400 yesterday, and he's going to send me the other money uh, in a couple days. He's so up. he won the bid. So he's now up. I take that money, I send him the trunks, Ron will send him the trunks, and then I'm going to divide that up between Richard Cologne, Wilfred Benitez, and Gerald McClellan. Nice. Uh, now, a lot of fighters obviously need help, but I, I kind of focus more on guys. Uh, I'll, I'd like to help anybody, but when it comes down to it, I help the guys like Benitez and McClellan who literally their sisters uh, have given up their lives to take care of these guys. And I mean, I'm talking 24 hours a day. And I've been around Gerald and I've been around Benitez twice. Uh, so I know I've seen it firsthand. Like these guys could not live without their sisters taking care of. They are literally like babies, grown babies. They have to be monitored 24 hours a day. They have to be fed. They have to be turned. They have to be taken care of. So the families, you know, Gerald's sister can't work. She's got to be there to watch this guy. So I try to help them, uh, you know, with money, and I sell things and, and raise money. Uh, let, me, let me cut you off for one second, John. Yeah. Obviously, I'm familiar with uh, uh, Gerald McClellan, obviously what happened with him. I watched that fight on TV. But as far as uh, Wilfredo Benitez goes, obviously I watched some of his career and all, and I know we hung around a little too long, but is, is, is his, uh, his injuries and the, the condition that he's in today completely from boxing? As far as I, yeah, as far as I know, uh, and uh, what happened, was, apparently, this is how. I also, want, I also, I also wanted some, I'm sorry to cut you off, John. No. I also wanted some clarity in regards to Jeremy McClendon, because I've watched the fight over and over. I mean, at least 200, 500 times that I just don't, you know, understand. I'm going to give you X. After, after John tells you about Benitez, I'll give you my take because I have a very interesting theory on Gerald McClellan mm -hmm. and John can, John's either going to agree with me or 
or I'm going to open his eyes to Fucking something or, or he'll have well, a whole different, different story. But, but well, go ahead. I, I'll tell you what. I, I got a little bit to say. I have a theory on Gerald, and I also have some inside information. I'll say this. Wilfred was famous for not training. He said – Really? The longest you could be probably it's probably on the internet. The, he said the longest he ever trained for a fight was 13 days for Sugar Ray Leonard. They said he would take a fight, train for seven days because his defense was so good he could just stay there. He didn't even use his legs. He didn't box and you know use lateral movement, so he would just stay there and guys couldn't hit him. Uh, so I think you know taking abuse from those guys, you're gonna get caught sooner or later. Uh, but he he's I mean he's bad. Like like uh, Wilfred is mm -hmm. is is literally helpless. Like he's a baby. He's like a grown baby. And uh, when did this condition start taking over? Uh, towards the end of his career, like, he was still boxing when he started showing signs of it. Uh, you know, and then Matthew Hilton knocked him out really bad later on. And the thing was, it seemed like later in his career, but because he was so young, he was still like he was only like twenty nine when it happened yeah, against yeah, Hilton. Yeah, he turned pro at fifteen. But he, right? but he, but he seemed like an old guy. Um, but here's, here's the thing about Gerald. I'll tell you two things about Gerald. One is that after the fight with Julian Jackson, the first just what fight, I was gonna Just what I was going to say. Go ahead. Maybe you're going to say the same thing. When he did the post-fight interview, the guy said to him, and I forget the exact words, but, you know, how do you feel? And I'll never forget. It always stuck in my head. Gerald said, I've got a tremendous headache. My head is really hurting. But, you know, winning the title will overshadow that or whatever the case may be. So my point was he made mention on the air of how bad his head hurt after the first fight. His next three fights were all first-round knockouts. He never got hit in a real yep. fight until he – and there you go, until he fought Gerald. Yep. Um, so you think I mean, until he fought Julie, um, um, Nigel, Nigel, uh, Nigel, Nigel. Nigel Ben. So, so now here's the other thing. You never Tarek Salmasi. If you know Tarek Salmasi – Tarek will tell you the story. He's told it online. They were sparring in the gym. That's the guy who was sparring he started blinking with, right? Exactly. Tarek said, right before that fight, he said, we were sparring, and all of a sudden, Gerald stopped and started blinking just like he did in the, in the Ben fight. And uh -huh. he said, you thumbed me. You, and uh, he was shaking his head like he was hurt. He said, you thumbed me. And, and, Tarek, and Tarek was like, ah, all right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. He said, after the sparring, they were in the dressing room, and Gerald told him, he said, he said, I got to admit, he said, you didn't, you didn't thumb me. You hurt me. And, Jer and Tarek was a welterweight. You know, he mm -hmm. wasn't a big puncher as it was. So yes. he always said, I, he said it was creepy when he saw him blinking against Ben. He goes, that was exactly how he was blinking when I hit him with the, with the jab. So, yeah. you know. Yeah, and, and Emmanuel Stewart also said the same thing. He said that um, – that uh, the blinking started in the gym in a sparring session. Um, right. So, but no MRI, all, nothing took place. No MRI, no head exams, no nothing. Back then, I mean, it wasn't as boxing was not well, as regulated as it is today. So, so I don't well, have the answer even, to that. Well, even even when it was, I'm gonna tell you. I'll tell you a story. Foxwoods Casino opened in 1992. They require, um, you know, the uh, the CAT scan, all these things, right? Around. 10 or 15 years later, they went, they changed it to the um, a neurological exam. Why? The guy at Fox was said, in the 15 years we've been doing fights here, not one guy has failed the test. Nobody. Zero. He said, yeah. some of these guys can't even talk. And I don't want to name names, mm -hmm. but I remember a former champion fighting there. He couldn't even, you couldn't even understand what he was saying. I said, how did this guy pass the, pass the CAT scan? It just proves, shows you that that's irrelevant. It doesn't mean yeah. anything, you know? Yeah, and you know what? What's funny is, uh, not, it's, I mean, Julian Jackson is, in my opinion, he's the hardest pound for pound puncher I've ever seen in my life. Um, yeah. How he's not in the Hall of Fame is just a tragedy. But uh, when he fought Gerald McClellan, who had an incredible chin, I mean, he landed some bombs in that first fight. He's in the Hall of Fame. Julian's in the Hall of Fame. Oh, is he now? Is he now? Yeah, I was there. I was there when he did his induction speech. You're right. That I was a couple years was, ago. It was either last year or the year before. Yeah. Um, I'm just used to saying the same thing for the last 15 yeah. years because it took him forever to get in there. Um, but he landed some, some, some hellacious shots on, on Gerald McClellan that stop everybody else that he fights. 
and, right. and McClellan okay. walked through it, and McClellan was a huge puncher himself. So when you got two big punches fighting each other, the bigger puncher becomes the guy who takes the better punch. So it come down to uh, McClellan could take Julian's punch, but Julian couldn't take McClellan's punch, and McClellan beats him. And then they had the rematch, but they had both had a couple of fights in between that. And, uh, yeah, McClellan had all early first-round knockouts. So he never really got hit again hard until he got back in that ring with um, – with, with, uh, Andrew Good. With, no, no, because he blew Jackson out in the rematch. I think it was one round, right? So then when he got in there with Nigel Ben, yeah, absolutely. So um, so he was probably walking around damaged goods for a year. It's just right. it's, it's fucked up. But, yeah, he was walking around damaged goods for a year. Mm. And, I mean, that was a guy, to my knowledge, you could probably correct me, but I don't think he was ever – I know I don't. he was never knocked down before Ben. He took a knee in those fights. He knew something was wrong with Somebody went down under his own uh, under his own admission, yeah. but um, I don't think he was. I've never I never saw him hurt in a fight, even buzzed. So I mean, you talk about a guy with a Golovkin like chin. So right. for him to go down from those shots from Nigel Ben, where the whole fight it never looked like he really got hit with that one clean bomb. I mean, it was a rough it was a rough go, but it was all those rabbit punches were contributing factors as well. Mm. And, and I mean I'm that referee thing. that referee let Nigel Ben get away with murder. Uh, but I'm going to tell you another thing that always bothered me about that fight. And I, you know, once in a while you get a guy, a critic that's never boxed and, and, uh, and it annoys you. And Ferdy Pacheco, Pacheco yeah. said he quit. His heart gave out on him. Ferdy is a doctor. That's what they call him, the fight doctor. He's sitting there 10 feet away at ringside. He's watching this guy blink. It didn't occur to the doctor that neurologically something was wrong. He said his heart gave out on him. He quit. Turns I'm out. Sure you, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Freddie Pacheco um, always came off as a, a pompous, arrogant fuck. Okay. Yeah. Who well, just to know it all. Man, you know, the, 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 the thing I love about him is he, he quit Ali's corner. And yeah, after yeah. the shit, you know, he told Ali, like, you're going to get hurt. You know, he was, he was not a yes man, a suck up. But like I say, as a doctor, his instincts to criticize the fighter, to be able to say, oh, he quit, he's a dog, you know, he really put his foot in his mouth that time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 you're right. And if I correctly recall, audio-wise, when Tyson fought McNeely, he was the one that said, oh, no, this kid didn't quit, he fought his heart out, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. First <laughs> yeah. round, so he was quick to defend Peter McNeely. We're, and right. McNeely's trainer jumped in the ring and stopped the fight. But he was quick to defend Peter McNeely in, in, on a first-round knockout of Tyson, or first-round loss of Tyson. But Joe McClellan, who you could see in that ring laboring and struggling and, 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 and really like something's wrong with this guy, criticized him on the air as soon as he went down. Yeah. yeah that was a terrible that was, thing. So that, that, I never that, forgot that. An example of, yeah. So, I mean, I never liked Freddie Pacheco because of that. Um, Let me ask you this. Because of that very fight. And that fight, I was 15 years old when I watched that fight. Uh, and I remember watching it. I was, but Joe McClellan was a monster. And they were talking about him and Roy getting together finally. I was going to get like, to that. It looked like it was going to happen. But, uh, but then tragedy struck. Let me ask you this. Both of y'all, respectively. Who's the best fighters you ever seen in the ring? Who's the best fighters you ever faced? Well, Skull is a hell of a lot older than me. So he's going <laughs> to... Put it this way, I, when, when I say that, I can't say, like, I, I love Sugar Ray Leonard, for example, but I didn't grow up watching Sugar Ray Leonard fight. So when you ask me that question, I'm only going to speak about who I watched during my lifetime. Yeah. That's three people. Roy Jones Jr., Floyd Mayweather, Lomachenko, the three most talented fighters I've ever seen in my life. You said Lomachenko? Oh, yeah. Hell, yeah. Those are the three most skilled and talented fighters I've ever seen. Okay. Scully? Now, I could easily put in other guys, and I could talk about Sugar Ray Leonard and other guys, but those were before my time. So gotcha. I saw that all on VHS and, I, and, and, and on YouTube. Um, <clears throat> I didn't really get to watch them fight live. Um, like live as, far yeah. as, as far as a pure skill, skill set goes, talent and, and skill set goes, those are my three. No question about it. Is In that order, too, Roy Jones, uh, Roy Jones, Floyd Mayweather, Lomachenko. Scully? I, I can't see anyone ever beating Roy Jones at his nope. best. Mm. Roy Jones at his best. And people say, 
he dropped his hands. He did that. He did this technically. I said, listen, it doesn't matter what he did wrong. I mean, he got away with it. And you, they say, well, that was his athleticism. I said, what, what does that mean? So he's not supposed to use his athleticism because it goes against your boxing morals? I mean, come on. He fought James Tony. He fought great technical fighters, including McCallum, uh, James Tony, Montel different Wade. guy, and, and nothing. And it didn't help them. You know, it didn't help them. Well, I mean, when, he, when, when Roy was on his game, people could say what they want. He toyed. He yeah. toyed with some of the best fighters. And I always look at it like this. Uh, I look at guys he beat, and then I look at how they did against other people. Mm. Those guys were magnificent against other people. But well, against him, they looked like they didn't even know how to walk. They didn't so even I, I put up a post just last week because I've been, I don't like to talk about fantasy fights, fights too much because you just never know. And a lot of it, you, 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 you're making your opinion with your heart. Okay, it's agenda-driven, okay? Mm -hmm. And usually when you talk about a fantasy fight, nine times out of ten, if you say, oh, well, you read, oh, well, Golovkin against Hagler, 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 the people are always going to pick the old generational fighter because they're, they, they, their career is wrapped up in nostalgia now. And you know what? you got to let the dust settle on a man's career once they retire and uh, before you could judge his body of work. So I don't like judging an active fighter versus a retired fighter. But that said, Roy's retired now. The dust has kind of settled on his career. He's really been done for years because these, this has all been window dressed in the last few years anyway. So that being said, I've been seeing a lot of posts lately about Hagler versus Roy Jones. So I put up a post myself. And I said, listen to me, man. Marvin Hagler is one of the greatest middleweights that ever lived, arguably top three ever, okay? Um, he wouldn't have won a single round against Roy Jones Jr., okay? It would have been a whitewash. Sugar Ray Leonard got off the couch after three years of retirement, drug and alcohol abuse, and one eye, okay? An undersized welterweight. And, and he beat Marvin Hagler, okay? He beat I thought Marvin it was Hagler. five. It was it three? I thought it was five years. Three years, three okay. years, three years. So you're going to tell me that Roy Jones Jr., who at middleweight, is a bigger, stronger, just as fast, hard-hitting, prime version of Sugar Ray Leonard, and Hagler's going to beat him? Hagler would never – Hagler would plow forward – and truck along, and he would, wouldn't find Roy Jones with a roadmap. Would never happen. Mm. You're talking about a guy that shut out James Tony and shut out Bernard Hopkins. You know what I mean? Roy Jones is just an absolute freak of nature. Yeah. Uh, Roy, look at Roy is the man. I, I, I'll tell you what. When I, I sparred with him as an amateur and as pro, right? When we were young pros, you know, he you me? A little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Was he faster, though? No, no. But, but listen, when I turned pro, all the, you know, and I'm sure everybody did it. Like when I turned pro, when we turned pro after the Olympic trials, all the top amateurs turned pro. So you're saying to yourself, well, if I fight this guy as a pro, I could beat him. If I fight this guy, well, if I'm, if I'm in great shape, I could beat him, right? And I could look at all the top guys, and I beat some of them as amateurs. So I was, I was comparable, you know what I mean? Roy Jones, the only one of the bunch where, as try as I might, I'm just like, I can't, I can't think of a way to beat this guy. You know, like he's just too fat. He's too hard. And especially in a real fight with no headgear and the small gloves, he's going to be cutting you. And, uh, and, you know, he was, you know, Ali, uh, Tyson said about Ali on Arsenio Hall show. He said, he said, every head must bow, every tongue must confess. He said, I can't beat that guy. Roy Jones. You have to – anyone who says they could beat them is either delusional. You know, I'm talking about prime. They're yeah. just delusional. They're just trying to yeah. sound good. Guys didn't go in thinking they could beat that guy. <laughs> but but I've, had, I've had recent debates with well-respected trainers that I don't ever and – and you're exactly like me. Don't ever call no fighter a fucking bum. I don't care if his record is 7-14. Is and 14. There's no fighter that's a bum. This man told me that Roy Jones Jr. was a bum. And I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? Who did he fight in middleweight? I said, he beat every man in front of him. And then he went up to 168. He couldn't make middleweight no more. But before he did, he shut out Bernard Hopkins. He beat, um, who's the Argentine guy that he beat? Castro? I was, I, was at, I was on that card. Yeah. Roy, that's the only guy that ever went to distance with Roy. He was 26 and 0 with 25 knockouts. Yeah, in he, he was the first guy to go to death. I think Roy was uh, 17 and 0. And Roy and, beat him every single round and busted his nose in the 10th round. Yeah, yeah, beat him up. Now, Roy, look at Roy. You don't at have to love Roy. Roy's a monster. At, at middleweight, Roy Jones was a hard-hitting dude. And he was at, at super middleweight as well. 
But at middleweight, Roy was a one-punch knockout artist, okay? Um, and, and he just outgrew the division, unfortunately. But Hagler wouldn't have had a chance. Monzon, as great as he was, uh, you know what? He doesn't translate on film. He's so basic with a jab cross and, and a hook, three punches, you know, basically. It's a different dynamic. Like, Roy, yeah. you know, I, I'll tell you a Roy, Roy Jones story. that, that and, and I picked Roy. I was one of the – because I had sparred both of them. I was one of the few people who, like, defiantly picked Roy to beat James Tony. Now, the night before the fight, I was in Las Vegas. Roy's manager and a bunch of people were there. And he asked me in front of everybody. He said, he said I, I respect your opinion. He said, I know you'll tell the truth. He goes, be honest. Who do you think is going to win tomorrow? And I said, James Tony's a great fighter, maybe pound for pound the best today, right? He does uh, so many unbelievable things. But every little intangible that makes James Tony who he is is never going to come into play against mm -hmm. Roy Jones. It's not going to mean – and I'll tell you what, You're talking what about triggered that. Toughness, making it a dog fight, like inside work, make, all those Like things. when he beat Iran, the way he beat Iran, he couldn't have sucked Roy into that. But I'll tell you what can't really, put, yeah, he can't, really... He can't told, put Roy in the ropes. He can't do any of those things. Right. But I'm going to tell you what really told me the, the story. You know, I, I when I hang around with fighters, especially back then, I listen to everything they say, you know, mentality. Why I, I actually beat guys who I knew before because of stuff they told me in a conversation and I used it against them two years later in a fight, you know? And I remember Terry Norris fought Simon Brown, and Simon Brown knocked him out bad. Yeah. And uh, so they come back, they have the rematch. Now, they had the rematch. I was going to see Roy in training camp the next day. So I watched the fight. Terry Norris beats Simon Brown easy, 12 rounds. Yeah. Like, yeah. beautiful boxing display. So the next day... I see Roy, and the first thing I say to him, I say, man, you see that fight yesterday? That was unbelievable performance. And I never forget his exact words. And Roy Jones was, then he wasn't even impressed. He said, he said, shoot. He said, I wouldn't have had to fight Simon Brown twice to know that was how to beat him. Yeah, and yeah. it always stuck in my head. And that's why when he fought James Tony, I knew he was going to win. Because he wasn't never, ever, ever in a million years going to give James a chance to utilize what made James great. Yeah, well, I mean, I was a huge Terry Norris fan, but Terry Norris, Terry Norris wasn't uh, didn't have much boxing IQ. Terry Norris was a hell of a fighter offensively. He could be a very good boxer when he wanted to be, and when he was disciplined, like he had to be for the Simon Brown rematch. But Terry Norris was was his own worst enemy at times, and that's why he took too many shots in there and got upset a couple of times. But uh. But Terry Norris, if Terry Norris wants to just go out there and box, Terry Norris could box his ass off. But Terry Norris right. had an anger streak in him, and we, when, when he hits you and hurts you, he wanted to kill you. Terry Norris, in my opinion, at least me, he's offensively the angriest fighter I've ever seen, the most vicious offensive fighter I've ever seen. Oh, all, Terry Norris was awesome. And yeah. if he had Roy's mentality, he, he would have been – He didn't have that boxing IQ. Loop, right. He had, that, he had that machismo where Roy – like I say, when I said when I when I was very excited about Terry's performance, I never forget. He was like, "Shoot, I wouldn't have had to do that twice." And it's just the way he said it was really indicative of something. Like he was, he thought it was ridiculous that they had to have a rematch. He said he would have done that the first time. Uh, so for better or worse, that's why. Just like with Floyd Mayweather, I was talking the other day with someone. I think uh, it was on my Facebook, and I was saying how. Everybody, these fools thought Pacquiao and Mayweather was going to be a great fight. They thought all of a sudden, for all that money, Floyd was going to turn in a Hagler Hearns performance. I'm saying there's no chance of that. He's going to do what he does. He he knows just like Roy how to beat the guy. And but how I also to beat the do guys. think I also do think that would have been a much different looking fight in 2010. Right, but but when they fought, when they fought, was, yeah, I, I I knew that Pacquiao was, was slowing down. And, it was uh, super easy to – I mean, think about it. People are so gullible. The guy lost. The guy got knocked out like a year before. Gullible. No. People, people thought that, that Fury – not only did people think that Fury was going to lose to Wilder in the rematch, but they're still picking Wilder in the third fight. And they'll sell it. And people <laughs> will bet on Wilder. Wilder will and never – he can fight Fury a hundred times. He will never beat Tyson Fury. Ever. Okay. And with that right there, we're going to come back. <laughs> We're going to do another follow-up on this conversation, and we're going to definitely start off with the, the next conversation 
um, at a later time, because we def I definitely want to get in the discussion with you guys in regards to Wilder Fury. I also want to piggyback on Terry Norris' situation and, and um and then go forward from there. I love Terry. Terry's mom. Terry. Terry. Terry's the man. We're gonna get back to that, but before we go, make sure y'all let everybody know your um, social media contact and all that. Um, Tommy Raynone on Instagram and on uh, Facebook. And uh, John Scully, if you go to McDonald's.com, you will see a picture of Scully all over their menu. I think he's on the half a meal box now. Happy meal. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Iceman John Scully at uh, Facebook and John the Iceman Scully at fa Facebook. Two different accounts. The Iceman is one word. Uh, and then on, on Twitter and Instagram, I'm pretty sure it's just Iceman John Scully. It's easy, easy to find. Uh, always talking boxing and uh, you know if you if you ever want to tune in and just see me destroy Tommy and, and you know anything boxing related uh, it's at any point in the day it could it could pop off it doesn't you know matter. Xavier could Xavier could do this next time we do this Xavier we could have a little boxing battle where Xavier's the referee and could spit questions and have like a quiz like scenario and I guarantee you as long as it's from 1988. To present time, I will beat Scully's ass. We're gonna we're gonna set that up. We're gonna set that up. For uh, hold on, hold on. Just one question: uh, yeah. Who who did who did Marlon Stalin beat for the WBC welterweight title? Marlon Stalin. Yeah. He beat Breland. See, you cannot compete with me. Wait, what year was that? Marlon Stalin <laughs> compete with yeah. me. He beat Lloyd Hunnigan. You Lloyd cannot Hunnigan. compete with him. And it was hey, February. What year was that? What year was it, that? Was I think February, it was February four, nineteen eighty nine. Oh, son of a bitch. All right, so, well, then we'll do it like this. Well, hold up. Hold yeah, up. Our, we don't rules. need to do anything. I just proved it. Back <laughs> up. <laughs> shut up. Shut up. Shut up. You ran your hat. We'll go in 91 forward, okay? 91 forward. Oh, no. Oh, now he wants to move the year up. Dude, I was 11 years old in 91, okay? I was going to know how to sum my name. All right, okay. so we'll come back to y'all soon enough, all right? Thanks, y'all. Appreciate y'all, man. All right, all right thanks. thanks for having us. All, all right. right. Peace. <laughs>